I want to suggest to you that the whole of life for us is charged with the weirdest, wildest, most wonderful possibilities. I have refused to live locked in the orderly house of reasons and proofs. The world I live in and believe in is wider than that, and anyway, what's wrong with maybe? You wouldn't believe what once or twice I have seen, I'll just tell you this. Only if there are angels in your head will you ever possibly see one. The year is 1988. Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up is at the top of the charts for the first time. Meanwhile, I am on the other side of the world, aged 18, attempting to smuggle Bibles into mainland China. I've deposited a sports bag full of banned books in a hotel locker in the city of Guangzhou so that a brother in Christ can travel right the way across that vast nation at the cost of more than a year's salary and at the risk of imprisonment to collect the precious contraband and secretly distribute them. Leaving Guangzhou, I reached the border, but a little too late, it has shut for the night. To make matters worse, a tropical typhoon is just beginning. It is gonna be a very long night indeed, soaked to the skin and trying to sleep on concrete. By 2 a.m., the floods are rising and I'm getting really quite worried. I pray for help and just then a total stranger appears out of nowhere and beckons me to follow. The stranger leads me silently through streets down twisted back alleys to a tiny glowing kitchen where a meal is cooking just for me. Stepping inside, I turn to thank the stranger but he has disappeared into the night. And so that night in a border town near Guangzhou, sheltering in a stranger's house from a fierce typhoon, I find myself wondering if the mysterious stranger is in fact a supernatural undercover agent, an angel sent by God to rescue me. As Mary Oliver says, only if you see angels and you believe in angels will you ever see one. Perhaps it's weird to wonder whether that stranger was an angel, but isn't that just the weird kind of question we ask ourselves continually as followers of Jesus? Because we learn to view the entire natural world through a supernatural lens. We learn to scan the details of our ordinary days for the extraordinary signs of God at work. We believe in angels, in miracles, in prophecies, in supernatural healing, in bread and wine meaning more than they might seem. The best-selling historian Tom Holland, perhaps best known for uh, his podcast, The Rest is History, was speaking to thousands of leaders earlier this year in the Royal Albert Hall, being interviewed by Nicky Gumbel. Tom Holland wouldn't call himself a Christian, he'd call himself an agnostic, but he has a very, very high value for Christian faith. And so Nicky said to him, what would you like to say to these thousands of Christian leaders? And Tom Holland said this, you need to talk more about the weird stuff. The weird stuff, by which I think he means angels, and healings, and prophecies, and water into wine. His thesis is this, that Christianity in the West has been too successful. Our churches pioneered care for the poor, and now we have the welfare state. Our monasteries pioneered hospitals, and now we have the NHS. Our scriptures taught the dignity of every individual, 
And now we have the European Convention on Human Rights. Perhaps all we've got left is the weird stuff. Perhaps that's all that the state can't take from us. The supernatural, mystical, inexplicable aspects of Christian doctrine, faith, experience. And so in this series, we're going to accept Tom Holland's challenge. He thinks we should talk more about weird stuff. In Mayor's Road Church, we're going to talk about the weird stuff. We do weird. We're going to think about signs and wonders. We're going to think about prophecy. We're going to think about dreams. We're going to think about the power of the Holy Spirit. And today, uh, in this introductory session, I'm going to seek to set out the cultural and intellectual context to show that Holland is perhaps right, that in many ways it's the weird stuff that ironically increasingly makes us relevant in the world we find ourselves inhabiting. Our message isn't that we just kind of have a vaguely viable, credible, moral alternative to the prevailing cultural narrative. Our message is that we have an incredible alternative to the prevailing cultural narrative. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. And we know that. We know that in our lives. It, it, it's the supernatural that kind of wakes us up to reality. We see this again and again on Alpha. People are happily sitting around discussing the merits of Christian faith and whether it's true or not and what you really think. And then comes the Holy Spirit Day. And we, a bunch of 21st century humans stand in a room somewhere and say, come Holy Spirit, and stuff happens. And people think, oh, this might be true. Some of you will be familiar with the, uh, um, most of you will probably be familiar with the, the, the psychologist, populist Jordan Peterson. He says lots of controversial things, some things very interesting, everything very interesting, some probably I agree with, some I don't. But what you can't deny is the cultural phenomenon. I mean, he's filling arenas around the world. He has multiple millions, probably billions of hits on YouTube and social media. And he wouldn't call himself a Christian. I think on one occasion he did, but then he went on to explain he didn't actually, strictly speaking, believe in God. So in my book, that's a slight uh, problem. But, but, but again, he's sympathetic, and he launched a whole teaching series on the significance of of the scriptures, the Bible. And um, I've talked about it before, but you know, as a member of this church, he goes to a CrossFit gym where the men, a uh, number of the men in the, in the gym are now studying the Bible, have been studying the Bible, not because of the church, because of Jordan Peterson's series on the book of Genesis. And so it's interesting, but he still wouldn't call himself a Christian. But his wife, Tammy, was supernaturally healed of cancer recently, and therefore she and his daughter were both baptized on Easter Day this year. Sometimes it's the weird stuff that wakes you up. You can talk and talk, jaw, jaw, jaw. The kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. And if you've ever... Um, you know, heard anything of our story in the 24-7 prayer movement. If you've read Red Moon Rising or Dirty Glory, you'll hear miracle after miracle after miracle. So let's turn to Mark chapter 16. We're going to read verses 15 to 20. If you're able to do so, let's stand out of reverence to the reading of God's word. Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 16, 15 to 20. Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. And these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They'll be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They'll be able to place their hands on the sick and they'll be healed. And when the Lord had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. 
And the disciples went everywhere and preached. And the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by miraculous signs. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. It's easy to forget, isn't it, just how weird the way of Jesus is to the modern Western mind. Here he is, physically risen from the dead. And we go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. No, no, no. Alive from the dead. Hello? And he is here promising miraculous signs to those who believe. And he's talking about casting out demons, glossolalia, handling snakes, and immunity to poison. Don't try this at home. Don't try doing a safeguarding thing on Jesus. Previously, Jesus has fought some kind of cosmic battle with Satan in the wilderness. He has changed 680 liters of water into wine. He has used a freshwater fish as a cash point. He has walked on a lake. He's walked through at least one wall. He says that he has witnessed Satan falling from heaven like lightning. He has conversed with Elijah, who had been dead for 900 years, and simultaneously with Moses, who had been dead for 1,200 years. And then he has assured his disciples, don't worry, you're going to do even weirder stuff than this. And they did. Peter goes on to heal the sick with his handkerchief and with his shadow. Philip will be supernaturally transported into the desert. Paul will hear audible voices from God and be blinded and then healed. John will receive mystical heavenly visions. Maybe we could handle that if it was just locked up in the Bible. He said it was kind of a different time and Jesus was a big deal and it's kind of, they were a bit more primitive then. But the trouble is, we believe, in fact, we have experienced that this stuff is still happening today. The weird stuff is still around. Some of you, in fact, most of you probably have heard Sammy, my wife Sammy's testimony. But I want to focus on one bit of it because it is just so weird. Sammy's cousin, Nikki, had come to know Jesus Christ on a kibbutz in Israel. Came back to this country, got engaged to someone down in Chichester and asked Sammy's sister, Andrea, to be her bridesmaid. Sammy's sister, Andrea, was training to be a nurse in Lewisham, London at the time. No Christian context, no church going, nothing like that in the family. They think Nikki's joined some kind of weird cult called Christianity. And at the time, Andrea is so deeply into the occult that she's taking readings for people, tarot cards, Ouija boards, she claims that sometimes she thinks she levitated. She, 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 she um, had a, 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 a strange psychic link with a guy. It wasn't a sexual thing, but they, they, it's, they could read each other's thoughts, she says. And she had a spirit that she asked for advice on everything. And so when she was invited to go down to Chichester for a dress fitting to be a bridesmaid, she asked her spirit guide, should she go? And the spirit said, no, you'll die there. But she was so depressed at this time that she thought, fine, whatever. And she went. And and it was a perfectly normal bridesmaid's fitting on the Saturday. And then she stayed over the night. And Nikki said, do you want to come to church with me Sunday morning? So she went. And it was Revelation Church and Roger Ellis standing up to preach. And Roger started by saying, well, a few weeks ago I wrote a talk on the occult. Well, I lost my my notes and I I happened to find them on my way out of the house this morning. So I'm going to do a talk on the occult for you today. So Andrea heard what the Bible says about the entire lifestyle she was living. At the end, she responded, gave her life to Christ, was set free from some demonic powers. She went back to Lewisham. And the guy she had the psychic link with was sitting on her step. And he said, what happened at 11.58 this morning? We lost connection. She said, yeah, I was set free. I died to all of that. I'm now alive. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, that story is a perfect blend of the natural and the supernatural. It's a bridesmaid's fitting. Roger losing his notes. If you know Roger, he's kind of scatty. And stuff that's just supernatural, that makes you think, really? 
Wow! You can't explain. And that's important because I want to suggest to you that it's not that we have one box labeled natural world full of rational scientific stuff and then another box labeled supernatural world full of weird miraculous stuff that's just sort of an optional extra for the religiously inclined. I want to suggest to you that the whole of life for us is charged with the weirdest, wildest, most wonderful possibilities. And that's what Albert Einstein said. He said there's only two ways to live life, as if everything's a miracle, as if nothing's a miracle. And we don't just need to talk about weird stuff. <laughs> Let's just talk about you woke up in a body this morning on a rock spinning in space and made porridge in a microwave. I mean, it doesn't get more mystical than that. Everything for us is a miracle. Let me tell you about one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, George Washington Carver. Born into slavery during the American Civil War. He was a leading agriculturalist, inventor, environmentalist, an advisor to three American presidents, one of whom, Franklin Roosevelt, established a national monument in his honor. The first non-president to get a, a monument was a former African-American slave who became a scientist called George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver nicknamed his laboratory where he did all his experiments, God's Workshop. He said this, I love to think of nature as unlimited broadcasting stations through which God speaks to us every day, every hour, and every moment of our lives if we will only tune in. See, we believe in the integration of the natural world and the supernatural world, a, a creation in which God is continually at work and speaking. In Emmaus Road Church, we believe in healing that you can explain through doctors, thank God for that, but also healing that you can't explain through prayer. We believe in getting guidance from street signs, very good idea, but also that God sometimes guides through dreams. <laughs> we believe that science answers questions like how the world works, very important, but faith answers questions like why we're here in the first place. Many of you will be familiar with Francis Collins. He led the Human Genome Project, mapped human DNA for the first time. He is currently the science advisor to President Biden. He says this, the God of the Bible is also the God of the human genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or in the laboratory, God's workshop. His creation is majestic, awesome, intricate, and beautiful. Maybe the weird things we believe as Christians aren't actually that weird at all. Maybe everything is weird. So this begs the question, why is it that Western culture sees our supernatural beliefs as strange, as weird? Why, if you walk into work tomorrow and announce that you pray in tongues or can hear the voice of God, will most of your colleagues worry about you? Sociologist Peter Berger says it's to do with plausibility structures. Things that seem self-evidently true, plausible, in one historical or social context will be deconstructed in the next. Beliefs, in other words, change. Ideas that seem crazy in one decade will seem entirely plausible in the next. And it's vital that we understand, therefore, the context in which we are living, the plausibility structures within which we are seeking to live as followers of Jesus and seek our faith in, uh, share our faith in him. Because this affects the way that we think and the way we communicate. So I'm going to attempt now to take you on a 150-year whirlwind tour of plausibility structures in the Western world, okay? Are you up for this? Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. 
Let's start 150 years ago, crisis of faith number one. It's 1851, and Matthew Arnold, the poet, is on his honeymoon standing on Dover Beach. And he begins to pen a poem that comes up with a line that has become incredibly famous ever since. He talks about the sea of faith. And he says, as he contemplates the tide going out on Dover Beach and the sound of the shingle, he, sa he says of the sea of faith, now I only hear its melancholy, long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges of drear and naked shingles of the world. That was a happy honeymoon. <laughs> Matthew Arnold is mourning the death of God. That was Nietzsche's phrase around the same time. The idea that the old religious certainties were retreating as scientific rationalism advanced. Every new scientific explanation made God a little bit less necessary. God of the gaps, God diminishing, God shrinking, God retreating, God becoming less and less necessary. A day will come when science will have answered everything and we will no longer need these primitive supernatural beliefs. And at that time, progressive or liberal theologians sought to save Christianity, so kind of them, by separating Christ's good moral teaching from his rather embarrassing miracles. They remade Christ as a good moral sage of the late 19th century in their own image. I read one Bible commentary where one of these liberal theologians was trying to explain away, you know the bit where Jesus cast demons out from a man called Legion, and it says the demons all went into a herd of swine, and then they all charged off a cliff and committed suicide. Tricky if you just believe in rationalism. You don't believe in demons, it's all just psychology and psychiatry. And so this commentator said, what happened in that moment was Jesus shouted so loudly that an entire herd of pigs was so terrified they all committed suicide simultaneously. And I sort of read that and thought, I think it takes more faith to believe, because I, I mean, I, I could shout at some pigs, I just don't think even one of them would commit suicide. <laughs> and, and you start to get into this space of what takes more faith is to believe there might be a God, a supernatural realm and things called demons or that you can shout at a herd of pigs and make them all simultaneously commit suicide. So that's 150 years ago. Science is advancing, religion is retreating, God is declared dead. Then let's go to 79 years ago. The plausibility structures are shifting again. There's another crisis of faith. It's July the 16th, 1945, and Robert Oppenheimer is watching the first nuclear detonation and famously and significantly, he chooses in that moment to quote the Hindu scriptures, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Suddenly the science we thought would answer everything and save us threatens to entirely destroy us. Is science our God or is it our Satan? Our utopian dreams of human progress lie shattered in the wake of two world wars. The intrinsic civility of humanity is no longer credible. The idea of literal evil no longer seems weird at all. But 20th century atheism continues to spawn an army, a plethora of other brutal ideologies. Marxist notions of an oppressive false consciousness, the Nietzschean idea that morality is relative, the Freudian view of life as a series of animal erotic impulses, and Foucault's idea that all truth systems are just constructs of power. And as a result of these atheistic ideologies, the 20th century was the bloodiest century in world history. We are often accused as people who are often described as religious, say, oh, religions cause wars, and we have to hold our hands up and say there's been terrible things done even in the name of Jesus. 
But we need to be absolutely clear that the most dangerous religious worldview ever is atheistic because in the last century, it was atheism that caused 187 million people to be killed in those two world wars. And so the Western world entered a kind of crisis of faith, a crisis of faith where, where for Matthew Arnold it's a crisis of faith because they're losing God. Now it's a crisis of faith in science and rationalism and humanism and the idea of human progress. And so now let's go back 50 years and we've got a third crisis of faith, a third moment where the plausibility structures are shifting because we're about to go global. The Beatles are dropping LSD and have moved to northern India and they're bringing Eastern spirituality to Western hippies. Meanwhile, immigration is growing into the Western world and cheap travel too. These things are exposing the Western bubble to alternative beliefs. And then of course the information age connects us fully, globally. And we begin to realize this shocking reality that the rest of the world out there is actually religious. They actually believe the weird stuff. And the weirdest ones are us who think that there is no God, no supernatural realm, and no meaning to life. Meanwhile, our own science that we've so worshipped goes weird with quantum physics, quantum theory. Physicists start to sound like wild-eyed mystics after all. And suddenly, an older, bigger, more spiritual worldview begins to be rediscovered on Guildford Science Park or wherever it is. I started this message with a story about seeing an angel, I think I did anyway, in China. And I've sought to show why such strange ideas perhaps seem less implausible today to our friends and neighbors. And the statistics back that up. The research shows that one in three Britons believe in angels. And if you just survey people who don't go to church, one in five. References to angels are everywhere in our culture from Robbie Williams, dear little Robbie Williams, loving angels instead, bless him. Top funeral song, by the way. Don't advise it, but anyway. Right through to the 15-foot golden angel that overlooks our city from the spire of Guildford Cathedral to the 14th century angel hotel and angel gate that dominates our high street. Do you know 74% of Westerners believe in an afterlife? Most of the people you will meet this week believe there's more to life than this life. Do you know if you go on TikTok... I don't advise this, but look up the hashtag witch talk. You'll find that 30 billion people are watching witch talk. How did we go from thinking that religion was retreating and God had died to 30 billion people watching TikTok, witch talk? Can you see what's happened over 150 years? Our plausibility structures have shifted. Cynical, secular humanism that seems so certain is starting to shake and to shatter. Belief in the supernatural is fully back. No wonder Tom Holland told the Royal Albert Hall, you guys need to start talking about the weird stuff. And for Holland, this is personal. Because he went to make a TV documentary in northern Iraq in the wake of ISIS who had been crucifying people. And he sat in the ruins of a church in a town in northern Iraq where ISIS, in their fury and desire to destroy, had even taken a pneumatic drill to the altar. And he saw on the ground a shattered picture of the Annunciation showing Gabriel's wings. And he says this, Tom Holland, it didn't remotely seem to me impossible in that moment and at that time that there might in fact be angels. Perhaps, listen, perhaps he says everything is weird and strange. 
And the moment you accept that there might be angels, then suddenly the world just seems richer and more interesting. Perhaps this is an exciting time to be a believer in the supernatural realm. Perhaps we don't need to be so ashamed of the weird stuff we believe. And so in this series, we are not going to be asking you to swap rationality for irrationality. We're not going to be asking you to sacrifice your cultural credibility for craziness. Quite the reverse. In this series, we are going to be asking you to question the craziness of an exclusively materialistic, entirely godless worldview with an infinitely more credible, increasingly more plausible and attractive conviction that our world is in fact enchanted, bigger than we thought, more beautiful than we thought, more inexplicable than we thought, fizzing perpetually with supernatural impossibilities. And so I want to finish with one more Bible story. It's 2 Kings chapter 6. You can study it in the week. We're not going to read it now. Verses 15 to 20. And Elisha is in a spot of bother. Him and his servants. Because King Aram has sent his soldiers in chariots to arrest him. This is like you've not just been you know, summoned by a couple of soldiers at your door, but there are tanks surrounding you. That's the modern equivalent. The king has sent his chariots. And so poor Elisha's servant looks around and he is really scared. And he says, Master, Master, what are we going to do? And Elisha prays that the eyes of the servant would be opened. And the most extraordinary thing happens. Elisha's servant, it's not that he stops seeing the chariots of Aram all around him. He doesn't stop seeing the natural, but his eyes are open to the supernatural and he sees the angelic realm. He sees the chariots of angels all around him and that changes everything. Yes, he's surrounded by an enemy. But he is also surrounded, and we sing the song, by the very chariots of God. And so I want to suggest that over this journey, as we do weird together, the Lord is going to open our eyes to see the supernatural realm more all around us. It's not that we're going to see the natural realm less. It's that we're going to see the supernatural realm more. Because remember, everything's weird. We don't have the two boxes. It's all one. Secondly, I hope that through this series, God is going to open our eyes that we might exercise greater authority in prayer. That we might, frankly, just see more miracles in our midst. Who here would just love to see more healings, more dreams, more angels? Just come back from church just saying oh no it's lovely this morning but it's like you'll never believe what I heard this happened to me last week Jonathan Aitken brilliant sitting on the platform Mervyn did such a great interview with him then I went for lunch and he told me the story about how he actually died and talked to an angel and then came back to life I'll tell you another time I don't even know if I'm allowed to tell it Mervyn can we find out it, I mean you talk about weird and I want to see more of that stuff. I want faith to increase in our midst. And finally, I hope that through this series, we will become more confident in, and take a few more risks in sharing our faith and praying with our friends. Does that sound all right? Great. I hear the band playing slightly new age music in the background. So it must be them. That's the signal. That's, this isn't for you. That's for me. That's their technique to tell me to shut up. And I've talked for long enough. Let's just pray, shall we? I'm aware that many of us may feel a bit like Elisha's servant. This morning we feel surrounded. Our problems seem intractable. The world, the flesh and the devil seems to be ganging up against us. 
can't see any easy solutions. And so, Lord, we, we pray with Elisha, would you open our eyes to see your purposes, to see the supernatural all around, infiltrating, impregnating our natural lives. Would you give us a bigger and a higher vision? Would you put a new eternal context on the problems of this day? And Lord, we pray too that you would give us hearts to believe, to live with greater faith. We repent of our unbelief. We admit, Lord, that we are often more shaped by materialistic, cynical cultural worldviews than we are by the scriptural worldview we're sorry help us to think like you Jesus help us to see the world as you see the world and Lord we pray for this church at this time would you raise the sea level of faith as we think together about the wonderful weirdness of your kingdom we pray that we would see more miracles. Lord, this isn't stuff we can engineer. Lord, I can write a talk, but only you can do a miracle. So we pray, Lord, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Father, I pray that we'd never be known for decent coffee or a style of worship. I pray, Lord, we'd be known as people where the presence of God is tangibly at work powerfully transforming lives disrupting worldviews so we pray all these things in the name of and for the glory of Jesus Christ Amen.